Good morning to all and welcome to this webinar on data accessibility. Uh, my name is Veli Pekka Sayo and I would like to warmly welcome to you on the behalf of the Council of European Energy Regulators. Today's webinar is the second webinar which we have uh, had in, in data accessibility. The first one was on the 10th of February in which we discussed more on market and consumer data issues. But today we will focus on system data and system operation side on the on the data accessibility. Of course, our webinar is something that we need to foster our discussion with the relevant stakeholders, especially on the different issues related to data accessibility. Sierra has started to work on, on data accessibility a couple of years back when we published our so-called digitalization paper, in which we of course took the first steps and look into the accessibility and useful use of our data and fostering innovation while doing that of course. But the key issues of course are to make sure that the consumers will have access to their historical data, especially in consumer data, consumption data in an easy way. And of course we would like to have a, and see that the data is usable uh, and of course the relevant network data should be appropriately available to current and potential market participants in an accessibility manner, of course. And of course, interoperability is a key issue as well. Uh, today, as we are discussing more on the <clears throat> system operation side on the data accessibility, of course, the digitalization in the energy sector is the key issue here, which will result much more data. And that should be, of course, handled in a proper manner. So the key issue here, of course, is the system operation guideline, which is already in place, of course, and we will discuss that a bit further in our uh, discussions today. Furthermore, of course, the TSOs and, and DSOs are key in these data accessibility issues, and their cooperation, of course, is vital. Now I would like to give the floor to the Marco, which is uh, he's going to be our coordinator, and he will um, introduce the webinar in a bit more detail. Thank you. Thank you, Beli Pekka, for uh, this introductory works. My name is Marco Pasquetwischeye. I'm the co-chair of the System Operation Grid Connection Task Force at CR and ACE within the Electricity Working Group. Uh, the scope of today is to uh, provide a, an interesting view of what is the uh, data exchange uh, seen from uh, system operation and uh, purposes. So the idea is to complement what uh, was already seen from the customer's point of view in the first the webinar last week with the views about the system uh, system operators. So system operators means TSOs, means DSOs, means also NRAs, and because NRAs are called to implement and to define all the whole set of rules, the entire set of rules based for system operation on this uh, for uh, based on that exchange uh, able to allow a proper operation of the system there are a number of challenges because uh, if tsos for example have always uh, considered uh, uh, collected and gathered data from uh, their uh, network this is not always the, the same issue for the dso and now there is also because of the renew the development of renewables because the development of small production units, small PGMs, uh, there are a number of challenges in the cooperation and the dialogue between DSOs, TSOs and significant grid users. But I would like to start immediately with the meeting and give the floor to Thomas Erz from the, the Bel in particular she is following the national implementation of European guidelines, uh, working in the supporting area of the Electric Control Center of the Spanish TSOs, and she has been part of ENSOE groups, and uh, in particular in incident scale working group and the steering group operational framework. So Ines, the floor is yours for a presentation about the TSOs views on the data exchange. Uh, thank you very much, Marco, for this uh, brief introduction. Um, well, first of all, um, before starting my presentation, please 
uh, let me thank you all for being participating in this webinar. I guess uh, the situation is not the, the one we were expecting one year ago, but um, still I think that uh, having so many attendees in this uh, webinar perfectly reflects how much uh, technology has evolved. So uh, it's uh, really nice to be able to organize this kind of event. So thank you very much and I really hope you, you enjoy it. Um, so, uh, once this is said, um, my name is Ines El Cabo and then I work at the supporting area of the Electric Control Center in Red Eléctrica de España, which is uh, the, the Spanish DSO, as you may guess from the name. And what I'm going to try to do with this webinar, with my presentation, is to give you the general overview or the vision that the TSO has regarding uh, how important data exchange is uh, for system operation. Uh, so, first, I think it's uh, important to say that the need of having uh, enough observability is not a requirement just for the TSO, but uh, for all parties of the electric system, since uh, observability uh, of the network elements and services that uh, impact uh, our activities is a requirement to, to safeguard operational security, frequency quality, and, and also the efficient use of the interconnected system and, and resources. And these three points are um, goals of the system operation guideline, the CACM and the uh, EVGL, uh, the electricity balancing guideline, which uh, I would say that nowadays are three of the main regulations that are uh, ruling the uh, electric systems. Um, so apart from the previous statements uh, now i would like to to focus on why specifically uh, data send is so important for the tso's and i think the reason is related to the task uh, that, that we are carrying out uh, so um, first according to the evgl the tso is the entity that is responsible of the global demand and generation balance uh, through the the procurement of uh, balancing reserves and also the activation of balancing energy bits. So uh, to do so, the TSO requires to have uh, accurate information, and this is uh, structural data since uh, we need to know the capability that we have in the system and also which uh, percentage of uh, that capability is um, available for providing balance services. Then we also need the schedule information for obvious reasons and, and then real-time information, uh, which is really important to determine the, the system state and also to determine the, the actions uh, to be performed. And uh, I think uh, these three kinds of information are also needed to, for example, feed the forecasting algorithms that uh, we require to carry out the, the adequacy analysis. Uh, I think this is getting more and more important since um, some time ago when we were used to these large-scale power plants that were uh, coal fire, for example. Knowing what was going to happen in the system was pretty easy. I mean, apart from the unavailabilities and so on, controlling the power output was all about uh, controlling the speed of the turbine, which uh, you could do by controlling the uh, inlet fuel mass flow, for example. But now we are seeing that more and more renewable energy is being put into service. And unfortunately, we cannot control wind and we cannot control sun. Uh, so um, I think it's really important to, to have enough information uh, in order to, uh, to calculate this uh, adequacy analysis. So uh, I would say that against the uncertainty, we need information. And uh, well, also other tasks that the, the TSO carries out and that require that we receive the, the accurate information, uh, for example, the performance of uh, contingency analysis in real time um, and also operational planning uh, for the year ahead, for example. Uh, so now that we know why data is so important for the TSOs uh, and also for the rest of parties uh, that are involved in, in the electric system, as I said before, uh, I think it's time to resort to, to the SOEL. Um, but actually, I'm not going to stop too much at this point since uh, we had a really nice presentation from Thomas in which uh, CORE were introduced. Uh, 
uh, important since uh, I'm going to talk about the national implementation of core afterwards. Uh, so uh, basically Article 40.6 of SOEL stated that by six months after the entry into force of the regulation of SOEL, uh, all TSOs shall jointly agree on these uh, key organizational requirements, roles and responsibilities uh, in relation to data science. So basically the compliance of this requirement was the, the origin of core methodology. Uh, core stands for key organizational requirements, uh, roles and responsibilities that are related to that exchange of that information that is required for guaranteeing the operational security of all involved parties. Uh, so since it defines a common framework for that exchange between TSOs, <clears throat> DSOs and SEUs, uh, it's a methodology that is actually removing barriers to that exchange. Um, and well, it's really important that it also covers all kind of information. It's uh, structural, scheduled, and, and real-time information. Uh, so relate, related to core methodology contents, I would say the four WU's questions uh, that uh, Thomas mentioned before. Uh, the who has to change information, which is applicability, which information has to be exchanged, how shall the information be exchanged, and when does the information has to be exchanged. Uh, the first two questions, um, the, the first answers to the to the first two questions are original implementation of Article 40.5 uh, for the ones the um, the applicability has to be defined at national level. So is the scope, but the scope is uh, based on the A to D categories from Article 40.5. So that will be the, the maximum, let's say. And then related to how information shall be changed and when does it has to be changed or even the frequency of, of that change um, that requires the national implementation of Article 40.7 and the remaining points from Article 40.6, which will be the, the that are open for national implementation from uh, core methodology. Uh, then obviously there are some confidentiality and accessibility requirements and responsibilities uh, that are um, um, based on the implementation of articles uh, 40.89 and 10 of um, SOEL. Uh, so uh, I think that when giving answer to this question is when the best benefit of core methodology so sucks. And the reason is that uh, this methodology was born as a really strong compromise between all TSOs in order to harmonize all possible data science requirements and responsibilities that uh, could be shared by all uh, systems uh, that will not compromise the full exercise of uh, duties of all involved parties. Um, so uh, I think it's important to, to remark this strong compromise since uh, just imagine all TSOs were sitting together saying, okay, we need to harmonize all the requirements that our systems are sharing. And since all systems are so different in the union, it, it was something pretty high, but, uh, but I think that uh, what we call the, um, uh, these requirements that were harmonized uh, provided some more sense. Uh, for example, establishing that DSO shall have access to, to the structural, schedule, and real-time information of SEUs that are connected to the grid. Uh, that's a harmonized criteria, so it doesn't matter in which country we are, we know that the DSO are going to have access to this information. Um, also, there are some access, for example, uh, related to the updating of information. Uh, SEUs have to review their structural information at least every six months. Uh, and that means that we are making sure that both the TSO and the DSO are going to have the uh, latest information from SEU, which is uh, pretty important, I think. Uh, then it also states that the planned and planned and availabilities have to be communicated as soon as possible. And uh, what Thomas said about uh, the, this uh, refreshing uh, rate of um, real-time information that has to be uh, less than one minute, for example. So in short, all the roles, responsibilities and requirements that are related to data science that all electric systems could share and that will remove barriers to data science are tied and well-defined in core. Uh, 
Um, on the other side, there are a few aspects that the core methodology leaves open for the national implementation. And the reason, as I said, is that it's, uh, electricism has uh, its own specificities. And uh, establishing a harmonized criteria to be followed by all parties may not be aligned with the requirements uh, related to data changes that need to be uh, fulfilled in order to guarantee the security of the, of the whole network. Uh, so the points that uh, are open for national implementation are uh, the scope of information uh, that shall be exchanged, as well as the granularity. I'll go a bit um, deeper with uh, the next slide uh, when talking about the national implementation. Uh, so is the applicability, and then, uh, for example, the scope and consequences of quality check uh, are also left at national level, and I think it's pretty important since might be critical for some TSOs, might not be critical for, for another, and also for the DSOs. And then the installation, configuration, security, maintenance, operation, everything related to communication channels uh, for that essence is um, it's also left at national level. Uh, also the frequency of that essence, uh, which uh, may differ from uh, one country to another and based on the different types of data that can be exchanged and, and the data exchange uh, purposes. Um, and then uh, the data exchange scheme is also left to be implemented at national level. And in this sense, I think that core methodology um, is pretty flexible since it's uh, establishing a, a default option, which is the one you can see uh, at the left side, which is the um, the non-cascade process in which the SU have to send the information directly to both the TSO and DSO. Uh, but then a different scheme can be implemented in each country, meaning that uh, a cascade scheme can be implemented uh, and the SU can uh, decide to send the information to the TSO or to the DSO. Um, there's an example I always like to, to talk about, which is the Spanish case. Um, the reason is obvious, I guess, since uh, I'm part of uh, the Spanish DSO. Uh, um, uh, it's an example I, I like to talk about, and is that the, the proposal we sent in, in Spain regarding this uh, real-time uh, data science scheme uh, was that the SU is completely free to choose which scheme they want to implement. That means that the, if you're SU, you are connected to the distribution grid, then you can choose to send the information to the TSO, to the DSR, or to both. Uh, the only exception will be in case uh, you are a balance service provider, in, this, in which case you have to send the information at least directly to a DSO, which means that you cannot send it to the DSO, of course you can. Uh, but since uh, times related to uh, response times and uh, related to balancing are, are so critical, it's important that the TSOs uh, receive the information as soon as possible. Uh, so then after the approval of uh, core methodology, the only thing left is that uh, its uh, TSOs and its country implements it. And uh, with the aim of evaluating which challenges uh, TSOs have found when doing so and, and to analyze and monitor the state of implementation at this country, uh, from NSOE we sent a, a survey uh, regarding the, the state of implementation uh, of core. Um, in this country, and from the given answers, um, we found out that most DSOs have already implemented Article 40.5 and the remaining points from, from uh, Article 40.6. And well, in case they have not, uh, it's, um, the, the proposal has been sent uh, for approval to the National Regulatory the uh, Authority or, or to the entity uh, that is designated by the member state. Um, and related to Article uh, 40.7, the, the percentage of DSOs that have implemented it is a bit lower. And I think the reason is that uh, it's strongly dependent on the national implementation of Article 40.5 and um, 40.6. And moreover, um, it does not require to be approved by the national authority. Uh, also, it was found that uh, some requirements or so some harmonized requirements um, have required some changes in the national implementation rules, uh, but these are 
mostly related to the, the new requirements related to real-time refreshing uh, data rates, for example, um, or the, the, the need of uh, implementing new uh, requirements related to the IT systems. Uh, but uh, the, the, the opinion we get from these uh, TSOs is that uh, even though they have to implement some changes, uh, they, they think that uh, this is going to benefit or make the, the data change a bit more efficient. And uh, finally, as I said before, of course, it's, uh, the, the, the scope of the science information has to be based on the A to D categories from Article uh, 40.5, while the applicability has to be defined at national level. Uh, so even though uh, we found that 17 TSOs have resorted to power output or the installed capacity as the variable that defines the need of uh, exchanging data, um, the threshold that was defined could be completely different from one system to another. So we found that uh, some TSOs um, or in, in some countries they were resorting to one megawatt as the threshold, some others were resorting to five megawatts and some other to 200 kilowatts. Um, and not only about the threshold of, uh, of this variable, but also uh, some in some countries that were resorting to the voltage um, level of the connection point, for example, or even to uh, the service that the SEU was providing. So I think this is uh, an outstanding proof of how different all systems are and how important limit space for specificities is. Uh, so uh, basically, as a conclusion, and after having stated how important it is for all parties to have enough observability, there are um, some benefits that uh, result from core methodology implementation at the national level also related to their requirements it uh, harmonized that uh, uh, have helped to to move a step forward when removing barriers to data change between parties um, basically is that uh, since core methodology is ruled by principles of uh, transparency proportionality non-discrimination and optimization between the highest overall efficiency and the lowest total cost for all parties the national implementation is as well. Um, the aspects that uh, CORE is harmonizing that made it possible to remove these uh, barriers and, um, and help to achieve a more coordinated and secure system. So it's uh, leaving a space for these specificities uh, also guaranteed that uh, all parties could get the observability they require. Uh, it also allowed for uh, coordination between all parties and, and it took into consideration the potential impact on DSO systems. And I think it um, also made it much easier and gave a suitable framework to, to define a meaningful uh, process of data exchange between parties. Uh, so these are my conclusions. So uh, in case you have any question, do not hesitate to uh, to ask them. Okay. Thank you, Ness. There is one question, mainly clarification. When mm -hmm. you mention significant grid users, you mean consumer only, or some board generation units and consumers. And can you provide a clarification on this, please? Uh, yeah, the SUs are the significant grid users, and um, when we refer to them in the core methodology, we are referring to, to the definition that is given in the SOEL, uh, which includes uh, uh, generation units uh, that are connected to the distribution grid, also to the transmission grid. And then uh, we're talking about um, demand facilities. For example, uh, it's uh, those ones uh, that are connected to the distribution grid and they are uh, providing uh, volume services and also uh, demand facilities that uh, are connected to the transmission grid. Yeah. Thank you for these clarifications. There are no questions, so I will leave uh, the floor to the next speaker. Next speaker is uh, Michel Wilk from eDSO. Uh, he uh, works for EON in Germany. He is representing now the European DSO Association and uh, he is <coughs> eating the expert group on criteria for significant modernization. So uh, he was also engaging in a drafting on the third energy package codes uh, before the, that leads to the adoption of the European network codes. 
and uh, uh, he is passionate on the decarbonization of the European economy and the corresponding evolvement of the role of the distribution system operator in the, this new decarbonized and sustainable <coughs> concept. So, Michael, if the floor is yours, and I expect from you a presentation of the DSO point of view. So, we have seen with Ines the, the TSO point of view about the exchange, but DSOs are playing a significant role as well. So please. Thank you, Marco. Um, yes, so, so as just said, I would like to, to shed some light on the, the DSO's perspective um, regarding data exchange. Um, so what I will re report about during the next minutes is uh, the results of the survey, which was carried out by Mark Malbranke and myself. Um, in preparation of this workshop, uh, we, we um, prepared a survey. So some questions, um, if you go on to the next slide, um, you'll see some statistics on, um, on, uh, uh, on the survey. Um, so we r roughly uh, prepared nine questions, um, shining light on data accessibility, implementation of core, how discussions have developed. Um, we all know from, from European level, then later on, on national level. Um, this survey was distributed among members of CDEC and EDSO, well, myself representing EDSO here today, and Mark um, representing CDEC. Um, we received 11 answers from eight different member states. So as you as you are very aware of, um, there are several um, DSOs per member state uh, in contrast to TSOs where you usually have one national TSO. Um, but um, well, what, what might be a, a problem to, to the answers received is that the majority of answers were received from Western Europe, as you can see on, on the map of Europe. Um, I prepared um, where all the receiving countries are marked. <clears throat> so Central Eastern Europe remains unrepresented. Please bear that in mind um, if you read through the answers and, and through the results um, of this survey. Um, so what? <laughs> uh, so what? The, the first question was, of course. Um, did, did core lead to a significant deviation um, with re, when, when it was implemented in member states? So my expectation, to be honest, was that yes, of course, it, it uh, was a, a significant deviation com uh, comparing, uh, compared to the historical situation before in the member state was necessary. But um, most surprisingly for me personally, at least, is um, that um, they are uh, not in all uh, responding member states. A significant deviation uh, was triggered by by uh, the implementation of core, um, but anyway, it opened the possibility for improvements. Um, so there were some some advantages uh, gained by DSOs. Um, I was very aware of of the discussions, the, the, the critics, uh, uh, which which was articulated in in discussions on European level at least. But but um, now we see that on national level, um, there were advantages also. Um, DSOs gain access to more data, to schedule data, to to structural data. They have haven't gained before, um, and um, of course the implementation of core also supported um, ongoing or planned adjustment in existing national data exchange regimes. Um, so um, we reviewed the availability of data, the, the, the collection of data from DER connected distributed energy resources, just to explain, um, connected to, to distribution grids. Um, from my uh, perspective, with my national background from Germany, it was also already uh, established that, that DSA's is um, um, collected data um, from, from distributed energy resources, but that doesn't seem to, uh, uh, that hasn't been the case in, in all member states in Europe. Um, of course, the volume and type of data increased significantly, uh, at least in some member states, um, and also data sourcing um, changed. <clears throat> um, the um, amendment of national rules, so th that, that's a good question. Was an amendment of national rules necessary? There was a, a diverse range of <laughs> how data exchange was established. 
um, between TSOs and DSOs um, and, and uh, DSOs and, and significant grid users or distributed energy generators or what, whatever you look at. Um, so in fact, apart from Austria, uh, which, which seems to be uh, 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 yeah, very specific case um, core generated in all responding member states, the establishment or at least the maintenance of the existing um, legislation or technical rules. Um, <clears throat> so, for example, from Germany, I can tell um, that before the entry into force or the implementation of core, it was uh, yeah, f at least from, from what I understood, bilateral agreements between the TSO and the DSO um, on data exchange. So as Ines said before, uh, we have now very much an uh, enhanced transparency. There is much more transparency and a much more harmonization on data exchange. <clears throat> um, so as we also already learned, um, not um, the implementation has not been finished, the implementation of core, the national implementation. Um, what is also uh, quite interesting to learn is um, that several DSOs mentioned that they got also under pressure um, that they were in need of more <clears throat> um, data exchange due to the increase of distributed energy resources connected to the system. So core was an advantage here, as just said before, um, that um, they could yeah, review the processes of data exchange and amend it um, uh, to a state where, where they gain the question they need for system operation. Um, Real-time data exchange, however, was uh, a particular point of attention and challenge for DSOs. That's at least from, from what I can see more to uh, depending on the historical situation where many DSOs um, all across Europe haven't been used to <coughs> collect real-time data or use real-time data. Um, in their day-to-day um, -day business, in their system operation. So if you if you operate your um, your distribution system in a more static way, as we did it in the past, um, you do not need real-time data um, usually, um, but but you just use planning data, for example. Um, now my slides were lost, but anyway, if you go on to the next slide, um, <clears throat> we go on to the implementation um, of, of core. Yeah, next slide. Yes, thanks. Um, so the overall process, so concentrating on the process, um, did DSOs have the impression that their position was sufficiently considered um, in national implementation? So as you are very much aware, at least as, as a representative of DSO, um, the, the TSO has a well an, an outstanding role in the implementation of core or in the implementation of network codes at all. Um, so the TSO was the one to uh, to at least draft um, those documents. Um, but um, yeah, that, that of course puts you in a more powerful position, which then of course uh, um, um, will lead to some, some criticism um, from other stakeholders. Uh, <clears throat> so there are DSOs which report about negative experiences, um, resistance of the TSO leading to, to only partial implementation of the needs of the DSOs. Um, TSO is strongly reluctant uh, to change the historically existing information exchange architecture. Um, so there were some national examples where um, distributed energy resources sent data directly to the TSO and the DSO in those, those countries had the um, intention at least to, to receive these, the data and then um, transmit it to the TSO. Um, to, to avoid circumvention of the DSO. <clears throat> so, um, for example, in those situations, um, they reported uh, reluctance um, of the TSO to change the existing regime. <clears throat> um, so, as said, and as the TSO was usually in, from, from process-wise in a more powerful um, 
position, there were the disadvantages of DSOs in comparison with TSOs um, with regard to routing, format, status coping, all this stuff. But there are also very positive experiences, uh, and <laughs> maybe maybe we should more focus on that. Um, so there were many, many good examples, best practice examples, um, where DSOs were, were very early involved um, in, in the process where they had informal active discussions, um, exchange on, on, on working level, um, and many, many issues of DSOs, many, many um, interests and, and, and needs of DSOs have been taken into account in such situations. And, and um, yes, they are really, DSOs are really satisfied um, if a process was, was laid out or made like this. Um, if we go on to the next slide, um, now concentrating on the results, um, as seen from the results, did DSOs have the impression that their position is sufficiently considered? Um, so generally, they are satisfied. DSOs are satisfied. Now looking back to the process and looking looking back to what has been reached um, um, with the implementation of core. Um, but um, well, be aware, the process is not finished in all member states. And um, there are some ideas, some needs already articulated, um, which where it could be improved. Um, so observability for DSOs, for example, um, could be improved in at least some member states um, with regard to what is going on in the transmission system. So observability, transparency for the DSO with regard to the transmission system, of course, in the surroundings of the of the connection point to the transmission system. Um, data exchange uh, with, with SGU, so usually renewable energy generators um, in those member states where the DSO is still bypassed uh, <clears throat> um, could be improved, of course, uh, from, the, from the point of view of the DSO. Um, there were some discussions I was also, also active in um, uh, going around aggregated data versus individual data to be handed over to the, D, to the TSO by the DSO. Um, very special, very technical discussions. I, I don't want to, to elaborate here um, on it. <clears throat> um, what you also have to, to bear in mind is that TSOs are not already, uh, are not, uh, 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 well, they, they are many, but they are also very, very diverse. Um, so you have smaller DSOs, you have, you have larger DSOs. Um, you might find situations, for example, in Germany where DSOs are cascaded. So uh, you have one DSO operating the high voltage system and then another DSO uh, completely different operating the, the medium voltage and the low voltage system. <coughs> And um, of course, the requirements would be different for such situations. Um, and um, also, our members or our respondent um, reported on some technically non justifiable data requirements, um, um, whatever that means in detail. Um, our data also important for, for DSO. That's more a rhetorical uh, question from my point of view. Of course, um, data data is important and is gaining importance for DSOs as well. Um, now with DSO digitalizing their their system operation and their business processes, um, they all confirm that that data is of course um, important for DSOs. Uh, for example, for system management and operation, for procurement of flexibility services, which might be possible in future, um, availability of customers' data for uh, billing purposes, um, for handing it over to, to, for example, suppliers, for supplier switching, all this stuff, um, implementation of energy communities, for example, um, allowing energy sharing be between grid users, not uh, necessarily significant grid users, um, by uh, as defined in, in the in network codes. Um, of course, in from information exchange with the TSO, <coughs> efficient planning of distribution systems, etc. So there are many, many use cases um, where DSOs need data for their own processes. Um, what we can see already, what we can already conclude is. Um, data needs and, and yeah, the, the amount of data goes beyond what is laid down in core. And SOGL uh, framework 
uh, that's not surprising from my point of view because SOGL and core um, really focuses on transmission system operation and what is necessary for that, where DSOs, of course, have many, many more parts um, of their system, which is not directly interacting with the transmission system, like supplier switching, for example. Um, oops. <laughs> Yes, thanks. Um, so we already, um, well, I already uh, reported on that. So we, we just learned what kind of data do DSOs need and for what do they need it. Um, so non-real-time data, of course, um, to, to analyze customer energy and power behavior, for example, um, for, for grid planning purposes, for example. Um, to evaluate fulfillment of services um, when, when we look at, at flexibility and what might come with flexibility, we of course need data to, to evaluate whether a certain service has really been, been delivered, has really been fulfilled, um, billing, settlement activities. Um, but um, also real-time data is becoming more and more important uh, for, for DSOs with all those renewable uh, energy generators connected to the system. Um, their, their system operation, the distribution system operation becomes more flexible, um, becomes more instantaneous. Um, so, of course, you need real-time data, instantaneous data delivery um, to, to improve the observability, to improve how distributed energy generators feed in, um, for example, to, to, uh, to see how heat pumps, how um, e vehicles are charging and consuming energy, um, to make sure that, that your system is inside the technical bandwidth where it can be operated securely and safely. If we go on <clears throat> to the next slide, um, so what about cooperation between TSOs and DSOs? Um, well, from my point of view, most of the DSOs <laughs> are satisfied um, with, with what has been reached uh, with regard to data accessibility and data exchange. Of course, there, are, there remain some, some problems, some points where, where improvements could be, could be reached. Um, so what what is a criticism heard often is um, also from other stakeholders that um, the application of, of data exchanges should be um, avoided to to avoid unnecessary cost. Um, um, so what is also problematic is um, if the granularity is is um, different between what the DSO need and what the DSO need that might lead to some discussions. Um, the, the necessity of real-time data uh, uh, from the TSO is, is something which, which is important to at least uh, several DSOs. Um, and then if there is a common data exchange platform on national level, um, of course, we have discussion on ownership, technology choices, distribution uh, or sharing of costs and so on. Um, and what is maybe a specific situation for Germany? If there is more than one TSO in a member state, um, it would be great if, if the um, data requests and, and, and uh, uh, yeah, amount of data uh, and scope of data uh, is harmonized between all those TSOs active in one member state. Okay. Um, so, with regard to DSOs and cooperation with other stakeholders, um, we, we um, received answers showing um, <clears throat> that there are usually no big difficulties um, with, with the, uh, regarding the implementation of core. That is mainly due to the fact that many, many at least larger stakeholders have been engaged in the discussions of implementation of core. Um, of course, there are some discussions going on um, defining all aspects in detail, um, potential necessary investment costs as usual. It's, it's also true for, for DSOs um, that it's always hard to, to, to understand uh, that you have to do a certain investment just um, because there are new obligations put on you. Okay, um, then if we look at uh, DSOs, um, <coughs> are there or did they face significant investments? That, that's a difficult question. <laughs> also from, from my personal experience, I can tell you that that's difficult, uh, hard to assess um, because you'll never know. So in some times, uh, some cases, 
um, DSO is, for example, with, with regard to the exchange of, of real-time data. DSO were, were in a situation where they would um, um, just just um, by by um, um, yeah, by, by they would renew or modernize their control center software, their SCADA systems anyway. And um, it's easy then and quite cheap to implement real-time data exchange with the TSO if you if you modernize your your SCADA system anyway. Uh, that's that's an easy function to implement. <laughs> Whereas if you are in a in a situation where you just modernized your SCADA system and you did not implement uh, real-time exchange with the TSO and you then want to to gain that feature, that could be very expensive, of course. Um, so that might, this example might explain <coughs> why uh, some DSOs answer that there were no costs at all, where other DSOs answer that there were far beyond 1 million euro of investments um, they had to take. There were many more examples um, where you have to, to look at the situation before and then try to assess um, what are the costs really incurred by, by the implementation of core and what is uh, costs um, which aren't really dependent on core or which which uh, where 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 situations where you could implement core uh, in in just um, um, time dependent modernization of your equipment um, should core be revised is a good question um, in fact not all DSL suggested that um, core should be should be revised but if a revision is uh, evaluated um, then the first um, um, suggestion was regarding the process. So from a DSO point of view, it should be made sure that, that each party is properly involved in future according to his roles and, and responsibilities. Um, data exchange duplication should be avoided. Um, Bidirectional data exchange between DSOs and TSOs um, should, should be implemented. Um, and um, of course, DSOs would like to see um, mo uh, more data exchange with grid users um, who are no significant grid users as defined in the European Network Code, because as just said before, DSOs exchange data also with, with other grid users to uh, ensure they can operate their system and they can, can fulfill their business duties. Um, so maybe just to summing up um if you look at all the the uh, responses received um we could sum up that costs of implementation are highly variable um as just explained depending on historical national situations historical national obligations um of course dsos as i said several times need data beyond the scope of core for all their other business processes for all their other duties like metering like supplier switching and national obligations and so on um DSOs aren't always satisfied with just being consulted, <laughs> so that's uh, with with regard to the process of the of the drafting and and consultation. Of course, uh, that that's a message heard more often during the last year, and which has already been taken account with the uh, clean energy package um, that DSOs are evolving in their role um, and need to be taken uh, more into account. Okay, that's from my side. Any questions? Thank you, Michael, for this uh, comprehensive survey with the number of DSOs. Unfortunately, we don't see the views of the Central Eastern Europe uh, of Eastern DSOs, but we will try to involve them in the next uh, activities uh, as this one. I hope that too. So, well, we received a bunch of questions. We are a bit late in the schedule, but I will uh, forward to you some of the questions. One is that, for example, what are the kind of flexibility services that the DSOs uh, uh, intend to provide and for which they need the data exchange? Well, that's, that's, uh, I, I, I'm not sure whether I'm the right one to answer such such questions, as I'm no expert for, for future flexibility services, to be honest. 
Um, but but when, whenever there is a consumption or generation schedule uh, um, influence in some way um, of, of a grid user connected to the, to the distribution system, of course, the distribution system operator just, for example, as, as a basic um, obligation, he has to make sure that, that, is oper that, that uh, the DSO operates his system uh, safe and, and securely. So what you need before is the schedule um, of, of in-feed or consumption um, and then afterwards, maybe for, for billing purposes or, um, or to make sure that, that a certain flexibility, a certain service has been provided, um, you need uh, the, the observability of what has been, been done in reality. So you might need some, some not necessarily real-time data, um, but, but it might also be real-time data, but metering data and, and so on. So schedule data, uh, metering data, real-time data, for example. Um, Michael, Mark, yeah, hi, uh, Marco. Um, I can maybe uh, give a further answer to to the question because, in fact, the the answer is already given in in the question. Indeed, the DSOs will in the future use uh, local flexibility, um, for instance, uh, to to solve congestion management locally, and we are indeed also thinking about uh, voltage control, so um, reactive power services, indeed. Thank you for both. Uh, another bunch of questions. I try to group some questions all together related to the mm, protocols. If there are some protocols, uh, different protocols for, exchange, for the exchange of information, if there is the possibility to have a sort of a third uh, platform, like a data broker, data platform for the exchange of, that, for the exchange of data, and if there are common rules already agreed for the uh, costs. So who is paying for? Well, we, we've got this idea of data exchange platforms, and at, I know from at least one member state that they already implemented a, a data exchange platform, uh, a central data exchange platform for, for uh, data exchange between TSO and DSO. Um, with regard to, for example, metering data, schedule data, and so on, that might be possible when it uh, when it's up to to real time data. Uh, I don't think, from a technical perspective, uh, due to the delays you you would gain with with another man in the middle, um, a data platform would would be a wise idea. Um, with regard to um, well, more static data. Um, a platform is possible. The question is which advantages do you gain and which disadvantages do you have to take into account when, when implementing a, a, a such a platform? Um, again, I'm, I'm not the, the expert for, for uh, the data exchange platforms. It's a very highly political questions in some member states. Um, you have to be careful because um, of course, as, as we all know, data uh, data is important and, and gains importance uh, in, in future system operation. Um, so from, from what I see is many, many parties are reluctant in um, um, agreeing to one central data platform if they are not really involved in the operation of such. Okay, thank you, Michael. And I, I will answer to the question about the how to identify significant grid users. This is uh, SOGL provides a standard rule, uh, for example, for generation Unix or type B Unix, uh, type C and type D are significant grid users, but the definition of type B depends on national level. So on the implementation of the rules for generic network code at national level, the same for DCC, so all the demand facilities that are uh, providing them as a response uh, shall be considered as significant grid users, but the exact threshold depends on the DCC implementation on national level. And then there are another key aspect to be considered in system operation that is the fact that despite the type B is a general rule, for the scope of that exchange, the, the uh, at national level, TSO, DSOs, and the regulators when approving these uh, rules may provide that the only subset of type B, type C, type, type B, type C, type D Unix are requested to provide to exchange data, in particular with respect to type D, connected to transmission system, compulsory. Type C, type B, that may be connected to distribution system, may be 
exempt in some cases, depending on the uh, threshold that and the relevance that are for the, the there are the DSO, the DSO deem for this data collection. So thank you, Michael, for this kind of presentation. We are a bit uh, late with respect to the schedule, so I would like to give the floor immediately to Louise that uh, comes from Ofgem. Louise uh, is working for, has been working for governance since 2005 and is working uh, in the data transparencies, uh, distribution level and change regulation for DSOs to better incentivize the new activities, in particular for flexibility markets. So Louise will provide us with a view of the Ofgem about the data implementation. Taking into account that Ofgem is still implementing SOGL, even if there is the Brexit, because SOGL was approved before the Brexit and Ofgem started implementing that exchange according to the European framework. So just to be an idea of what they have done, what they intend to do in the future. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, and thank you very much, Marco. Um, well, I think my title says it all, really. Um, from our perspective, data and digitalization really is essential if we're going to achieve an efficient, effective energy system. And because of that, we've been working with government to really understand what the gaps are in achieving our goal of having a modern digitalized energy system and how we can fill them. So actually picking up on a point Michael made about wider data needs, in my presentation, I'm actually gonna zoom out a little bit and talk a little bit more broadly about what we're doing to try and change how people think about sharing data. So a couple of years ago, um, we commissioned an energy data task force jointly with the government um, to establish what the problems were in relation to energy system data and to set out recommendations. And they set out five key recommendations which were to digitalize the energy system, to fill the data gaps. Secondly, to adopt the principle that data should actually be presumed open in the first instance, and then only restricted for specific purposes, rather than the usual approach, which has been that most data is protected and private, unless you're allowed to access it. And then the last three recommendations were about improving the visibility of data through data catalogs, so that people actually know what information is being captured. Um, secondly, having visible asset registrations visible to all. And thirdly, visible infrastructure need, um, visible infrastructure assets. So both ourselves at Ofgem and government endorse the recommendations we really recognize the benefits that this could bring to system planning and operations and, and more efficient markets as well. So we've established a joint modernizing data program to implement this vision in partnership with the sector as well. And you can get more details on the task force recommendations and the program itself from the web links on the slides. But just to give you um, a brief summary of what is in that program, um, it's it's got a set, it's got two sets of, of, of activities really. Firstly, it has a set of innovation activities, and secondly, a set of policy and regulation activities. And really important to flag up that this doesn't actually just focus completely on the energy sector because it really recognizes that data sharing across sectors is just as important to support holistic decision-making and outcomes. So for example, Innovate UK are running a two million pound innovation competition to develop the right architecture that will allow efficient data sharing and enable interlinking of existing and new data sets across different sectors. So, Alongside this, of course, um, industry itself um, has been um, very busy. Um, and uh, this, this particular slide uh, gives you a flavor of some of the initiatives that have taken the challenge of opening up data and working in a number of ways to achieve better data visibility. So for example, the Energy Networks Association, which is the trade association for gas and electricity distribution and transmission network operators. 
um, has a data working group to collaborate, collaborate, collaboratively, excuse me, I can't talk today, um, address data issues, both across electricity and gas, um, to access new data sets and to identify opportunities to get more value from existing data sets. So um, I have a few links on this slide um, where you can get more information about some of the initiatives happening. Um, although I should stress that these are clearly not all of them and apologies to anyone um, that I've missed out. So last but not least, um, what has Optium been doing? Um, so we've been doing a number of activities that really permeate across almost everything we've been doing. We've been establishing our expectations um, across all of the work we do. So for example, um, we've been really clear that we expect there to be better use and open visibility of data to be made wherever possible while continuing, of course, to ensure that parties adhere to legislation on its safe and secure use. We're developing data best practice principles and also setting out our expectations for digitalization plans. And these are going to be embedded in new license conditions for system operators. We're also looking at some of our other license conditions and updating them to ensure that there is better sharing of um, very specific data um, that our stakeholders have told us is, is really important to have. And that's both in improving the visibility of that data and also the interoperability of it. We're also considering whether other um, more focused license conditions are needed as well. Meanwhile, we're encouraging industry to see where improvements can be made um, in industry-led changes. And I've been involved in some of those discussions and it's really great to see that greater recognition and understanding of why other parties might value data that's currently not shared. And we have already seen some positive changes happening as a result where industry have brought through forward code changes and the other um, code changes that are in progress um, as we speak. Um, I should also add um, that there's also a number of fantastic, fantastic initiatives in better open sharing of asset registration information and also some digital mapping initiatives. And last but definitely not least, um, we're also working with different parts of government and across other sectors to see where innovation and new cross-sectoral strategies could help to enable easier movement of data across sectors. So a bit of a whistle-stop tour, but that's all from me. Um, please do take a look at our website if you'd like to have more information about any of the actions I've set out today. Thank you very much. Marco, hopefully I've, I've uh, caught you up a little bit of, of your time there. Yeah, thank you, uh, Louise, for uh, keeping on track the all the webinar. And uh, for this kind of experiences, I would like to uh, give the floor immediately to Arianna that is working in, at Harera, Italian regulator, and then open for the questions. So Arianna is uh, uh, joined Harera three years ago, is working uh, in uh, the in the implementation of the um, <clears throat> market service ancillary service market, and for which that exchange is a, it plays a very key role. So Arianna, the floor is yours for providing Italian experience in the implementation of that exchange. Okay, thanks Marco uh, and thanks also for the invitation and a good morning everyone. Today I'm uh, going to present to you the status of the data, the data exchange implementation in Italy. Sorry, okay. As the speakers before me have already told you, the SOGL regulation, in particular article from 40 to, 50, to 53, provides general requirements in terms of uh, uh, roles, responsibilities, organi organization, and the quality of data exchange. In particular, article 40 states, states that 
each TSO in coordination with the DSOs and the significant grid users should determine the ability and the scope of the data exchange on structural data, scheduling and forecast data, and real-time data. But uh, why do we need this kind of regulation on data exchange? In Italy, essentially, we, uh, we need it because the, um, the Italian electricity system is evolving towards a decentralized system based on distributed generation. In fact, in the upper part of this slide, I've reported the change in terms of total electricity, uh, gross electricity production between year 2000 and year 2019. And we can see that uh, non-programmable renewables, so PV and wind, represent about 15% uh, of the uh, total gross production in 2019 while they um, practically didn't exist in year, to, in year 2000. Uh, in, uh, at the bottom part of the slide, instead, I've reported the number of installed plants, and we can see that while electricity production has, in, has increased just uh, slightly, the number, of the, the number of plants instead uh, changes a lot between year 2000 and year 2019. So we can infer that the Italian electricity system in year 2000 was based on uh, a few number of very large power plants mainly connected to the transmission system, while today uh, the electricity system is based on a very large number of, of, a few, um, of, small, um, of small power plants mainly connected to low or medium voltage networks. In the, this chart, I've uh, only reported the trend of the distributed generation since 2012 in terms of number of plants, gross capacity and gross production. And also in this chart, we can notice that the gross capacity and gross production uh, slightly increase while the number of plants doubled. So to recap, in the previous slide, we have seen that uh, now the Italian electricity system is based on uh, a very large number of plants connected to the uh, distribution network. And so these plants are not really seen by the TSO. And therefore, improvement of data exchange is uh, necessary. Uh, data exchange implementation in Italy has a long journey uh, over time, and it is in uh, this slide I leave you the main references. And first of all, in uh, 2015, the Italian authority launched a forced data sharing uh, about the distributed generation plans between the SOs and the TSO. Then, after the uh, SOGL regulation with the resolution 628 of uh, uh, three years ago, the, um, the Italian authority initiated a process to implement the SOGL requirements in Italy on that exchange. And with this resolution, the authority identified the, the main steps necessary uh, for this kind of implementation. The first step is represented by the uh, consultation made by the, the Italian TSO, TERNA, about the implementation of that exchange made in coordination with the DSOs in terms of applicability and the scope. Uh, this, uh, this first proposal was approved by the authority with the resolution 36 of uh, last year. And then the last step is the uh, consultation made by the authority itself regarding uh, timelines, retrofit of existing plans and equipment. So uh, the proposal made by the DSO in coordination with the DSOs um, identifies the, the, applica the, 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 the applicability and the scope of that exchange in terms of structural data, scheduling the forecast data and real-time data. First of all, regarding the structural data, um, the, the proposal um, requires that they, they must be provided by the significant grid users, which are uh, owners of all power plants, HVDC systems, and the consumption plants that supplied um, the load interactability service to the TSO. 
this kind of data were in part already defined in the Italian grid code and in this slide I've only reported the, the most significant innovations introduced by the implementation of article 45 of the SOGLs, which are for example the, the, the data required on active power control capability, frequency response capability and the dynamic simulation for HVDC systems. Uh, regarding uh, scheduling and forecast data, instead, um, they must uh, provided by significant grid users, which are owners of um, significant generating and consumption units, and they must provide the uh, active and reactive power output and availability, scheduled and availability, and active and reactive power restrictions. Finally, Regarding the real-time data, the uh, proposal made by the TSO in coordination with the SOs identified two um, application perimeters. The first one is the so-called standard perimeter, which is made up of all power plants with capacity of at least one megawatt connected to the medium voltage network. In this case, these plants must um, send um, measures on the active and reactive energy produced by the entire power plants and also active energy produced by single generators only in case of power plants made up of individual generators with a capacity above a certain threshold. These measures must be uh, sent every four seconds. The second application perimeter identified by the TSO with, in coordination with the DSOs is uh, instead the so-called extended perimeter, which is a significant group of power plants with capacity less than one megawatt connected to low or medium voltage networks. In this case, the plants connected uh, to the medium voltage network must uh, uh, provide the measures on both active and reactive energy produced by the entire power plants every four seconds, while the, the plants connected to low voltage network must provide only the measures on active energy produced every 20 seconds. I'll go fast on this slide since Time, uh, times are, are tight, uh, and uh, I've only reported the, the, the data required by the TSO and the DSOs with uh, the corresponding accuracy and the sampling rate. So, uh, real time in, in this simplified chart, you can see uh, the communication channels between the significant grid users, so the distributed generation that send the data to the DSO, so the DSO is the one responsible for the uh, collection activity, the, the data collection activity, and then in turn the DSO send uh, these, um, these measures to the TSO. Real-time data will be used by the TSO as an input for an estimation algorithm based on a statistical probabilistic approach. So by means of measures obtained by Sentinel plants, the Italian TSO will be able to estimate the, um, the overall pro um, electricity produced by the distributed generation. And so hopefully reduce the, the amount of reserve needed, for example. The last step, as I've already said, is the consultation made by the authority itself last year, the consultation number 361. And in uh, this uh, uh, consultation, in particular uh, regarding the standard perimeter, the authority suggested that uh, the, the producer should be the one responsible for the installation of the necessary data collection equipment, whose uh, um, standard requirements are currently being finalized by the Italian Electrotechnical Committee. Regarding the retrofit for uh, existing plants, so plants in operation, the authority propose that uh, producers that uh, will uh, install quickly the necessary data collection equipment will receive a premium to foster the, the retrofit itself. Finally, regarding the, the extended perimeter, instead the authority suggests that uh, this kind of uh, data exchange implementation will be implemented in a second phase and only if necessary for the system security in order to reduce the system cost. 
Partner more, the authority uh, suggested that the extended perimeter should be divided into the extended perimeter um, made up only of plants connected to the medium voltage network, and then the extended perimeter connect, uh, made up of only plants connected to the low voltage network, since the necessary equipment but also responsibilities can be different. In fact, regarding the extended perimeter, um, the one responsible for the installation of the, the accessory equipment should be the producer as, as the, the standard perimeter. While uh, regarding the extended perimeter um, made up of plants connected to the low voltage network, the, the VSOs should, should be the ones responsible for this kind of, of activity. For me, uh, that's all. If you have any question, please, uh, please ask me. And thanks for the attention. Thank you. Thanks, Arianna, for the presentation. Thanks, Luis. I have a question for both. Uh, it still came back from the probably the previous session, but his work also for the regulators. It is about the so-called data hub. Because uh, uh, what about if have you ever evaluated uh, in your experience, natural implementation, the possibility to implement a data hub? Uh, in order to share and collect all the data related to the grid, for example, real-time schedule and structural data, or is this still uh, under evaluation or will be uh, or is already being evaluated and completely neglected? So um, from from our side, um, this this isn't something um, that we've excuse me, taken any decisions on yet. Um, I think there's there's still a lot of work to think through um, the best way to to share data and, and who's best placed to do it. Okay, thank you. Ariana? So for us, Data Hub is under, ev under evaluation, but the, the proposal made by the TSO in coordination with the DSOs identifies a solution that... Uh, identify the DSOs, the one responsible for the data collection activity, and then send, uh, send this data to the, to the TSO. Okay, so at uh, the moment, it is uh, this one, the, the solution. We have two more questions for Arianna. One is, okay. uh, is two more questions, but with the same approach. So the first is that if you can clarify better what is the concept in the extended versus uh, sentinel perimeters. And then uh, the second one is, if you can clarify a bit, uh, who is going to pay? for the okay. cost of implementation. Okay, yes, of course. I'll, um, regarding the difference between the, the, the extended and the standard perimeter, uh, okay, the, the standard perimeter is uh, made up of plants connected only to medium voltage network and with a capacity above uh, a certain threshold, which is one megawatt. Instead, the, uh, the extended perimeter uh, that will be um, identified only in a, in, a, in a latter phase, in a second phase, uh, it, uh, it will be made up of plants connected to both medium and low voltage networks uh, with capacity less than one megawatt. So um, to date, the, the, the extended perimeter is not yet uh, identified. In, in, in detail. So it is a sample of plants connected to medium or low voltage networks. Uh, instead, for the second question, um, I think that it, um, it is on a retrofit for, of, of existing plants. So uh, as I said before, the, the, the producers that uh, will install quickly the, 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 the necessary data, call, um, the necessary equipment for for the, the data collection activity, um, will receive a premium. This premium will be paid by the TSO, by the DSOs, and obviously the DSOs then uh, receive the, the, the amount that, that pays uh, by means of the electricity bill. Uh, the value of the premium is, an, uh, is not yet uh, defined, and it will be defined after the uh, identification made by the Italian Electrotechnical Committee of the, uh, the cost of this, of this standard um, equipment and accessory for the data exchange. Just a 
we request. So Ariana, if I understood correctly, both extended and standard perimeter will deliver real-time data, but for the standard perimeter, all, P, all uh, uh, planks above the threshold, one megawatt are com is compulsory. For the, yes, uh, for the extended perimeter, there will be sampled according to criteria identified by DSOs and TSOs. Okay, yes. Perfect. Thank you for the information. And for the, and the cost of that exchange, retrofitting, it means that is compulsory, that should be is compulsory, but there will be a sort of incentive regulation in order to speed up. To foster the, to foster the retrofit itself. Okay. But both for both, uh, I, I understand for the standard perimeter connected to medium voltage, but also for the extended perimeter connected to low voltage, or for the extended perimeter, the cost will be borne by the, the DSO. Um, regarding the extended perimeter, it should be defined. Um, I mean that the extended perimeter, as I said before, it is composed by plants. Uh, it will be divided, partially divided, into standard perimeter um, made up only of plants connected to the medium voltage network. And in this case, the producer should be the responsible for the installation of, the, of this equipment. And so uh, retrofitting, um, and so uh, it will receive uh, a premium also in this case as uh, for uh, the, the standard perimeter. Instead, regarding the extended perimeter made up only of plants connected to the low voltage network, this is different because um, the, the one responsible for the, 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 the this installation uh, should be the DSOs. And so uh, the costs are, um, are covered by the, the, the electricity bill. Uh, okay, there is a question for Stam, still another question for Italy. Is about the uh, pilot with logs demand side. Is it scheduled? Uh, I will try to answer by me directly. Uh, uh, if the, you mean the pilot uh, with logs for uh, for procuring services and ancillary services, there is a general framework uh, approved in 2017, the decision 300, and uh, uh, there are a number of pilot projects, including loads, including virtual plants, including a number of other activities with this uh, expert. If you mean a pilot project with exchange of data for demand side response, these are uh, the demand side are significant grid users, and so they are subject to the same data exchange theoretically, but we need to implement this. A, a clarification also for the data hub for Italian website, just to clarification, Italy has a data hub for customer purposes, for settlement purposes, and it is managed by the single buyer, and this is a data hub collecting now, so far, only the data related to the consumers, but also data related to injections, so for, will be moved in the data hub, but for settlement purposes, so in order to collect the information about the injection profiles, real-time data necessary for the system operation for a secure and safe system operation should be collected in a timely manner. And for this reason, what was provided also by Mark Malbranca about the delay in having a third party in the middle and the, in the, was keeping into account, was kept into account in Italy, duly considered and the final decision was at this stage is to implement only a DSO gateway in the middle because both DSO and TSOs need data for the DSO networks. For transmission network, no DSO gateway data are immediately sent to TSOs as for the current SCADA. So this is just to understand. So thank you, Luisa and Ariana, for the nice and fruitful implementation and discussion. And now we can move on to the last part, probably the most interesting one with the panelists. So I will give you a quick introduction of our panelists. So we have Ines that is uh, uh, working at the Spanish TSOs. We listened to her in the first part of the webinar. We have uh, Mark Malbrank representing SIDEC is another association for this of uh, distribution system operators. He is currently working for Synagri, that is the Belgian Association of Distributed Transport System Operators for Electricity and Gas, with a strong European focus. 
We have a European Commission represented by Jakob Filiakowski that works on World Series Electricity Market. He was the former chair when he worked for NE Control for the ACE Grid Connection System Operation Task Force. And uh, so he has over 20 years of professional experience in the electricity sector. We have also joined in Pat Brown from the Electric Power Research Institute and where she works in the information and communication technology research area and is uh, uh, really involved in the data change models, IT issues. And okay. And then we have finally Thomas Holtz from uh, Bundesnetz again tour uh, that represented the regulators. So I invite you to provide the questions in the chat in the, and we will filter out the main relevant question and address them to the speakers. But in the meantime, I have started with some questions from my side to the speaker, in particular for, to, uh, to Jacob and Thomas. What is the role of data exchange in the green transition? May it be a facilitator? Green transition is one of the key, um, key topic, key, key issue for this, uh, for the future, according to the European perspective. So I would like to ask to both regulators and European Commission, what is the data role of data exchange in this field? Please. Thank, thank you, Marco. So, so uh, thanks for inviting me uh, to this panel. So uh, it's a pleasure to, to be with you. Uh, I think that uh, today we are in data-driven society. So when we talk about, we think about green tra transition, we should also think that uh, it will be uh, maybe not driven by data, but enabled by data. So uh, if we would think about renewables as a hardware part, uh, the data exchange and this information layer could be considered a, a software part which should enable the integration of renewables and which should enable this green transition. And I think that most of the aspects how this data exchange should help us uh, has been covered by other speakers. And I, I noted uh, and tried to categorize them into different categories. And I found Two categories which were mentioned, one which was maybe in my view omitted and then one overarching category. So uh, one angle is the system security and all the data which uh, TSOs and DSOs need for the secure system operation. And I think Ariane brought very nicely with number of hours TSOs and DSOs to secure the system, this is this year, which is pretty much yeah. by your, your sound is quite broken. Another uh, yeah, try, try to add your video because your sound is quite broken. General categorization that has been uh, mentioned by. Uh -huh. better yes. now? Much better, please go ahead. The category is digitalization and uh, and for me this is everything, thanks, this is everything what comes uh, uh, under the increased participation of energy consumers, uh, it's about aggregation, flexibility, uh, when we think about electric vehicles, I think that all that would come uh, into something what we are uh, inventing now and this is something uh, what, uh, what will be coming. Uh, Given that I'm coming from the wholesale market unit in the co Commission, I would uh, still like to highlight the importance of data for market efficiency and increase of the market efficiency. And here I find two uh, very good for me striking examples. One is the EU balancing platform where Acer took the decision that uh, the pricing of energy uh, on AFRR platform should be done on four seconds basis. So we basically talk about price formation given the offers and given the volumes on four seconds basis it's a huge amount of data and then when we think about the future and also the increased market efficiency i would not underestimate the need for a recalculation of capacity and monitoring of the grid to increase those capacities so 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 i think that this is something what what comes also as an important driver and enabler for uh, for the for the green transition. And at the very 
And the very end is something, again, what Louisa mentioned, is data sharing across the sector. So when we talk sector integration, uh, we don't only talk about uh, the sharing of the data, but we talk about the cross use of the data between different sectors. And I think that those would be the, the drivers and different aspects of how data to fit within the context of business processes that are accomplishing what needs to be accomplished. So it's just my little pitch for it's, you know, the data management piece is a really important part of making data do all it can do for us. Thank you. I would like to move to the next questions is about challenges and difficulties in the implementation of data exchange at national level. This is a question mainly related to the TSOs and the DSOs, so to Ines and Mark. I have already seen that in the presentation in the first part of the workshop, some challenges and difficulties along with some pros uh, have been highlighted by the speakers, but I would like to see you um, a wider perspective on the, this kind of, of on this argument, please. Yes, maybe I can start. Um, Ines, is that okay? Yes, sir. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, if we if we look at the um, the explanation we got regarding the SOGL and, and the core. So we've seen that um, provision of data to both uh, DSOs and, and, and TSOs um, are, are put as a sort of default uh, option. And of course, this model can be revised at a national level in order to allow uh, significant grid users to uh, the provision of data only to the DSO or only to the TSO. Um, what we uh, see is that um, those models described uh, in core and SOGL are, are very different, but we see also um, appear the different models in the member states. Huh? We've seen already uh, now today an example where um, the information is uh, put through the DSO. Um, of course, this is because member states have uh, different starting points already and um, for those already working in a, in a certain scheme, even before CORE or SOGL, uh, there is not necessarily a, a great appetite to, to change it if, it if it works, of course. And um, on the other hand, in some cases, this, this can block, uh, of course, uh, new developments. If we then, if we then go, um, if we look a little bit closer to the different schemes, um, we can start with the default one as described in CORE, where the SGU has to deliver um, information both to the DSO and the TSO. Um, in this case, of course, we are sure that both DSO and TSO receive the, the necessary data, that, which is good, but we can ask ourselves, is this then identical data? Um, and does this mean that in a significant use, a grid user has to put in place two parallel uh, data streams? Uh, which makes it not necessarily the preferred option for the, the significant grid user, of course. Um, this scheme can work maybe in a case where the DSOs and TSOs join forces and create, for example, a, a common platform uh, through which all relevant data is shared and for which the significant grid user uh, has only sent, uh, has only need to send data once, which of course is, um, uh, good for avoiding extra costs. The second scheme um, where information goes directly from the um, significant grid user connected to the distribution grid to the TSO, um, of course there it's good there is only one data stream but it bypasses um, the DSO who needs then to receive the data from the TSO. You can imagine it, this is not necessarily the preferred option for the from the DSOs um, because in order to master challenges of the decentralization of generation as it has been said before the increase of quantity of distributed energy sources and the increasing electrification of different sectors 
uh, from a BSO perspective, um, data management for system operation purposes, uh, let's say congestion management, for instance, well, should probably be organized along the natural structure of the grid, as we call it, and it's, that means uh, naturally uh, bottom up. If you look at the last scheme where the information goes directly to the DSO and then further to the TSO, um, well, we can imagine that is in some cases maybe not the preferred option for the TSOs, but uh, DSOs, at least during the establishment of CORE and SOGL, have defended this scheme as, as proper for them. So, as you know, for the DSOs, that is mandatory, um, especially for resources connected to their networks. Uh, and as for uh, TSOs, the right level of information, mostly aggregated, should be reasonable to ensure a proper balanced coordination between DSOs and TSOs uh, in the process of operating the system. Um, this, the same can be applied, in fact, for flexibility data. Uh, DSOs will need to, first of all, ensure the proper operation of the networks and the distribution system make use of these kind of solutions and then keep the impact of other uses such as the needs for the TSOs uh, under control. Detailed observability is in this, is in this uh, case key to ensure the right operation of, uh, of the networks and, and to support the users on top of it uh, as well as the flexibility market operation. But we, are, we, however, understand that in some cases, TSOs may need direct information. Um, so even if this last scheme was the preferred option, uh, as I said, for the DSOs, we see uh, in some member states development of common DSO-TSO solutions, which may have uh, a lot of added value in terms of uh, flexibility for the parties to gather the necessary data. Um, also to lower the cost for implementation. And if we look specifically uh, on the um, flexibility platform, then we, we, I can give the example from Belgium where there is um, a, a flex hub, as we call it, a flexibility platform in which uh, DSOs and TSOs gather necessary information about the grid users connected to the uh, distribution grid offering uh, just at this time balancing services but there will also uh, this will be followed by uh, day ahead intraday uh, uh, information and then also uh, the capacity remuneration mechanism which we want to put in place in Belgium. So that's uh, mainly what I can say about um, the DSO side of, of things. Okay, so uh, from my side and uh, related to, to the implementation of uh, data sharing at the national level, like um, all these uh, remaining points that were uh, led from, from CORE, of course, there were some difficulties attached to, to the national implementation, like, uh, for example, uh, creating uh, legally binding agreements uh, within eight month, uh, 18 months, sorry, uh, with all relevant parties uh, can be challenging. and. Obviously, the, the approval process of the national implementation of CORE uh, can take a long time and, and compromises are needed. Um, in those cases in which both the DSO and the TSO need the same information with the same granularity, then reaching an agreement is pretty easy, but uh, obviously it's not always the case. But uh, apart from these difficulties, I, I think it's really important to dig into the, the drivers as well. Uh, since uh, considering the, the amount of points that, that are open to national implementation, CORE is uh, providing a very flexible framework uh, that uh, warranties that both TSO and DSO all over the union shall have access to all the information they require. Um, and this is uh, assuring at the same time uh, the, the efficiency in that exchange. Um, it's important to point out that also NRAs or uh, another entity designated by the by the member state um, can assess and adapt the national uh, data same scheme in case uh, the the new um, adaptation is proved to be more efficient and, and responds to to all operator needs and. Um, 
also uh, we can say that um, core methodology eases the, the participation of SEUs in balance services uh, as well as uh, in the coordination between the, the operators and I mean TSOs and DSOs for the contingency analysis, for example, which is uh, the basis for, for other services such as uh, congestion management. Um, all the drivers, for example, are the, um, they allow to, to implement different quality requirements for real-time data change, uh, which might be more or less critical depending on, on the uh, system. Uh, and then if if we talk about the, the schemes that might be implemented for, for data change at um, its different country, uh, I think the, the most important thing we need to remark is that doesn't really matter which scheme we are implemented since uh, both DSO and DSO are actually getting the same information uh, or the information they need to uh, to operate the grid with um, security. Obviously, uh, cascade and non-cascade schemes, they will have uh, pros and contras. I would say that, for example, for um, the non-cascade process, um, the, the main pro is that both the TSO and the DSO shall only receive the, the information they need to fulfill their duties. Uh, and in case the, the SEU is re, um, reviewing the structural information, then the TSO and the DSO could not have to oversee the communication between the two to communicate these changes. Um, the main contra, I would say, that is that the, the communication channels uh, will be duplicated and in case the SEU is responsible for the maintenance, uh, the installation, uh, even for the quality check of, um, of data, then the, uh, the cost for them may be increased. And uh, in case we are talking about small scale uh, SEUs, for example, uh, then this cost may represent uh, a relevant uh, share of the overall benefit of the um, SEUs. Uh, but then if we talk about the other model, uh, the contrast could be the other way around and the price could be the other way around as well. Um, uh, of course, if we talk about this model in which the DSO is directly receiving the information, once again, the TSO will receive the, the information thanks to the communication links between DSO and TSO. Uh, but we need to keep in mind that for some uh, services, such as balance services, the TSO needs to receive the information directly, since um, times are critical for, for response uh, related to balance. And I think that's affecting both TSO and DSO. So uh, that's a reason. Thank you. There, are, there is there are questions related to the uh, technical reasons why a cascading data exchange for congestion management is needed. So it's coming from the audience uh, with respect to your contribution, probably Ines or so Mark, if you want to say something on that, please. Um, yes, maybe it depends on, on where we have the congestion, of course. Huh? So, yeah, if we have congestions on the distribution grid, we it's up to the DSO, of course, to to manage this and to procure flexibility if needed for for uh, resolving this congestion. Um, of course, if if there is uh, congestion on the dist in, on the transmission grid, it could be also um, that uh, the transmission the the TSO needs um, flexibility from the from the um, distribution grid, but by using electri um, uh, by using um, assets connected to the distribution grid, we have to avoid that um, new congestions on the distribution grid. In that case, uh, could occur. So it's uh, in that case, it's it's important that a a cascading is is working in a way where um, the DSO um, can, in time of uh, of course, um, restrict the the service if needed um, to avoid problems in in the distribution grid. That's uh, that's uh, I think an example of how this can uh, could work. 
Uh, yeah, I think that both uh, cascading and not cascading will play an important role uh, at this point since, uh, as I said, um, it, uh, it's not uh, dependent on the scheme we're implementing since uh, the important part is that both TSO and DSO have um, uh, enough information to do so. Um, obviously, uh, depending on the case, depending on the system, we are talking about one scheme or another um, is going to be implemented. So it's not something that it's um, harmonized uh, for uh, the whole union. So uh, it really depends on, on the system we are talking about. And it's uh, something that uh, has to be analyzed at the national level. Thank you very much. Maybe, Marco, um, I, because uh, Ines uh, touched it, and, so the, the, I, and I didn't really uh, elaborate on that, uh, when we were talking about the main drivers to, to its implementation uh, on the national level, what we see is, um, yeah, so implementation of this data exchange and or, or additional data exchange has been uh, very different in the, in the member states. Um, yeah, in, in some cases, it's clear that for operational needs um, not directly linked to a core NSOGL, um, there was, a, a, yeah, it set in motion already before um, by a further increase of distributed energy resources and development of flexibility uh, markets. So it is clear that core and SOGL uh, triggered a lot of work, let's say, but um, it was also clear, it's also clear that um, drivers for implementation of data exchange um, were broader than, than only core and SOGL. That's I just I, what I wanted to, to add. Thank you. And uh, uh, I would like to uh, involve Pat Pat is an, an expert from a research center, so he's work, she's working on the data model. So what is the view of your uh, your view on these modeling data change models, Pat, about this topic, please? Okay, well, I, I think probably sort of critically, um, there. When you're looking at data exchange, it's really important, kind of as I had mentioned earlier, to make sure that the exchanged information is viewed as part of a larger business process, um, as part of, and, and that the data that you're exchanging is clearly defined with a semantic model, so a, a model that organizes the information and allows you to understand the precise meaning of the information. And, and taking that kind of bigger picture view of data exchanges means that those data exchanges over time are um, more easily extendable. Um, they can support additions far, e far more easily than if little point-to-point -point individual exchanges are put in place just to you know, fix the current problem right now. So you know, that, that kind of, as we think about exchange between entities, I think that's probably a foundational um, concept to really think about it broadly. Um, I guess another topic that hasn't been raised at all, but it certainly has been going through my mind as I've been listening to this, is the, the challenges that face particularly DSOs in getting their information organized internally well enough to be able to share it cohesively. Um, TSOs have four decades of experience in managing network models, in um, preparing models and cases for network analysis. DSOs don't. And they have, what, 10 times, 20 times as much data to handle um, so I, you know, I think as I would look around, I would really wonder if the um, some of the major difficulties for DSOs won't show up really as they're expected to, on a more and more frequent basis, provide better and better information about their grid. And and to me, that's you know, just practically speaking, that's that's probably one of the largest challenges. Um, to actually implementing something that works well. 
I don't know, I would be interested to hear what other people, you know, would have to say on that sort of reality check topic. Maybe I can react on that, uh, Pat. So, yeah, it's, well, the DS, others also have a very long experience in data managing, uh, uh, namely collecting, validating, and so on, providing data uh, to also guarantee security of supply and quality of service. Um, as well as um, to support uh, market market activities, it's it's not new. Uh, it's extra data exchange indeed. Uh, if we talk about flexibility and so on, that's new. But if you look at the um, data exchange with other parties in in today's um, DSO's operations, then this this is a whole a broad. Um, uh, portfolio. If if you look at connection, disconnection, change of contractual conditions with the grid user, operation of the distribution grid, of course, uh, the network planning, DSO TSO coordination, uh, billing of the customer, um, supplier switching, uh, asset management, and so on and so on. So it's 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 not that data collection and data uh, handling is new to the DSOs. Um, Okay, we we see that indeed we will have in the future um, more data to be handled, uh, more uh, more to real time indeed. Um, of course, this this is this is evolving, and um, yeah, DSOs are following this this evolution. So, but it's but it's yeah, it can be a, a challenge, of course, to to put um, in place the necessary platforms or necessary systems to 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 capture all those this information and what we could say also is that yeah distribution grids um, have, uh, well are becoming smarter some are already smart some maybe less uh, we we as DSOs have to better know um, indeed what is happening on on the grid that's clear with all this decentralized energy resources and and all uh, kinds of um, services that does, are going to be delivered, DSOs will really have to know what is happening when uh, on their grids to to be able to manage it uh, in a way that we continue to guarantee uh, this quality of service, of course. Mark, maybe then I would follow up on that Pat's question. I wonder to what extent uh, this really depends on uh, the size of DSO and the voltage levels managed. I think we have a tendency to generalize that DSOs are the same, whereas we talked about those national specificities. But mm -hmm. the reality, and I imagine that many were dealing with the data already, but some may not necessarily. Jakob, I didn't really understand the last few uh, sentences, but I suppose I under, I more or less know what you want to know there. It's um, it's indeed, um, yeah, as you know, we have 2,400 DSOs in Europe. Um, I can tell you that we are um, not operating at the same um, voltage levels indeed. There is a really nice picture existing somewhere where you see uh, all uh, member states and then the, the 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 division between transmission, what is transmission and what is distribution. And I can mm -hmm. tell you, if you take that table, it's not a, 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 a strict line going from top to bottom. It's um, there are a lot of differences indeed um, between um, the operated. Um, uh, voltages and as we know um, if we go if we make the distinction between low voltage medium voltage high voltage um, then we see that of course for these different uh, layers we we have different needs um, mm -hmm. and of course um, some yeah if we if we look just um, now more uh, recently at uh, the flexibility services, if we look at the medium voltage, we we think that, for instance, for, uh, in Belgium, we have a very good um, um, 
yeah platform put in place to to manage this um but if we then have to go to the low voltage then we see that this we we cannot copy paste mm -hmm. the same um way of working to low voltage it's this is impossible we have to work differently and this is of course uh, indeed a challenge so to to come back yes we need different information on different levels of of distribution grids I hope that was more or less what you asked, uh, Jakob. <laughs> Thank you for this uh, very interesting uh, interaction between the different uh, <coughs> perimeters of activities in low voltage level for the TSOs, the DSO, the different approach for DSOs and TSOs, and the contribution by part about the amount of data. There is a question comment by the chat, by the audience, is about the mean that the SOs have very long experience with smart meters too, and so they have a good experience in having big data uh, of methodologies in order to uh, their uh, experience to have a big data. Just to complement this, I would like also to put on the table another key topic that was discussed a lot last week in the uh, webinar about market data, market for data power. It is the, 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 the ownership of the data. Who is the owner of the data? Up to which, to which extent the data may be, shall be made public? Up to which extent the data shall be kept confidential? I would like to see the view, starting view of Pat on this top, topic, and then to leave the floor to Jacob Thomas for uh, uh, the regulatory and the legislative point of view. Please, Pat. <laughs> so I will defer quickly um, to Jacob and Thomas on this, but uh, because EPRI does more work around sort of technical kinds of research than policy um, sorts of, of research. Yeah, ob obviously there is a conversation that needs to be had because there are so many, um, what's the right word, facets of requirements or or parties that have interest in this and that, you know, all I could say is yes, this is, a, this is an area that needs a lot of conversation. So with that, Jakob, <laughs> it's yours. Thanks, Pat. So uh, I think that this question, on, only on that question, we could have a two hours conversation and and uh, and different. Uh, the the, on, the ownership of data is uh, is a tricky question, and uh, I noted with a bit of a surprise today uh, the statement by Louise that uh, in UK uh, they uh, already went in the direction of uh, data should be uh, public and restricted right. only as yeah. needed. This, this was a bit of a surprise to me. Uh, and as much as I uh, welcome that uh, approach personally, I think that we have to bear in mind two aspects. And one which was uh, mentioned in the very beginning uh, is uh, cybersecurity and, and how to keep the security of the data and how to keep our network secure. Okay, Jacob, you are. It is to be the platform issue. I don't have those problems. The platforms, it better. It better now. We cannot hear you quite well. We can retry a bit later. No, it's we better. cannot hear you. Your, uh -huh. your is broken, so please wait for a minute. Thomas, if you can. Yeah, and now? No, much better now. You can go ahead, Jacob. Yes. Oh, okay, so just maybe one more uh, sentence. Uh, apologies, it seems to be a platform issue. I don't have those problems on other platforms. I think what, what we need to remember still uh, are our EU values and the trust in data by society. So. So I think what is important is uh, the privacy and data protection rights. So, so this is something what we should always bear in mind uh, in EU when we talk about the, the ownership of data. And I think one of the aspects which is also not negligible uh, is the neutrality. 
we we had those discussions with DSOs uh, whether they should own the data or not, and then I believe immediately come the uh, the question of unbundling of DSOs and how this data would be used or monopolized. So so indeed a very tricky issue, uh, no immediate answers. <laughs> Last question for our panelists. Before we have another question from the audience, is not DACA provider the owner of its data? This is a tricky question. Is, is there someone who wants to address something on this about the data provider, the relation between the ownership of the data and the data provider? Okay, I think it's a very tricky question and uh, it's this with the same <coughs> position uh, 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 stated by Jacob in its opening statement. We will need a couple of our conversation on this aspect about uh, data ownership, data providing, security, cyber attack and so on. <coughs> Probably this will be, we will take into account this question and it, uh, all these responsibilities, these issues and comments when dealing with the cybersecurity network code in the coming months, that will, uh, will be a good a challenge for both regulators, member states, DSO, TSO, European Commission. Last point to our all the other panelists. Very, very short reply. <laughs> My question is, that implementation according to the current rule of SOGM so without taking into account the impact of cybersecurity network code, without taking account any impact related to extended scope of the data as mentioned by Mark, limiting to SOGR, please, quick answer, a date. What is your target date for the full implementation? Shall I start or? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, go ahead. Okay, yeah, I can base my answer on the TSO survey we sent out from uh, NSOE. So I would say uh, for the national implementation of article uh, 40.5 and the remaining points from the uh, core, I would say that since most TSOs have already implemented it or uh, they have sent the, pro the proposals for approval, uh, end of uh, this year, beginning of next year. Uh, we talk about Article 40.7. I will go. Um, I will give one more year. So uh, end of um, 2022 and beginning of 2023. Okay. The DSO position, Mark. Yeah. Well, this is a difficult one in the sense that we didn't explicitly ask uh, when. <laughs> DSOs ha had an idea of, of um, having this um, core completely implemented, but um, yeah, we'll we'll probably have to follow um, yeah what what it, what has been said by Ines, uh, but I, I I really can't specifically uh, or explicitly uh, point out a date because in for the for this question I I had also in mind that it could instead of having a, a, a timing target that we probably had uh, better a, a sort of framework target um, um, because it's it it would be better to focus on the real needs in every member state for the implementation of the different types of uh, information exchanges maybe we do not need all the exchanges at the same time uh, maybe certain exchanges are not relevant for certain member states and then as earlier said uh, differentiation between the type of dso's maybe also there we have to see what is needed what is not needed and of course um so in this in this frame a framework target um, which of course indeed uh, should give an answer to the above mentioned needs um, for the flexibility in implementation but yeah Giving an end date is, is very difficult. Pat? <clears throat> this is not one that I feel qualified to weigh in on at all. Sorry. <laughs> okay. So, Thomas, what is the view for the regulators? Yeah, indeed, it's uh, difficult to specify as 
one date for all because of the differences in the national regimes and the, the levels of implementation. For that reason, I, I, I guess uh, it's uh, appropriate that uh, the respective NRAs follow up uh, and check the implementation level. And also for ASA, maybe there could be a task uh, uh, in respect to the SOGL implementation to catch up on 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 this. Uh, so hard to set a specific date. I think that we can catch up your uh, suggestion and to include uh, or to ask us to include the monitoring of data exchange in implementation in the next in the future SOGL implementation report. Mm -hmm. uh, what is uh, Jacob? Your final? Uh, your, what is the European Commission expectation <laughs> on the implementation? I mean, I, I, coming from po policy uh, direction, I would ask the question back: uh, Haven't you included a deadline for implementation as regulators? <laughs> I was hoping there was a deadline. I don't remember there was no. Uh, uh, obviously, uh, my answer can only be a uh, ASAP. So, uh, so uh, end as needed. Okay. Thank you. So, thank you for all the speakers for this uh, very interesting discussion and debates. There are a number of uh, positions that were very interested and a number of points that were touched upon. And uh, I kindly ask you, uh, thank you for your uh, availability. And I will uh, give the floor for our final remark to Luis, that is representing Velipec that cannot uh, be uh, uh, for the entire, <clears throat> cannot couldn't be for the entire meeting because other uh, duties. But Luis is a vice chair of the, DS working group uh, also for the CR and is uh, uh, I'm uh, have the pleasure to have the air uh, to conclude this session, please. Thank you, Marco. Um, yes, um, as vice chair of the DS working group, I'd like to sincerely thank all of the presenters, panelists and moderators today for your very informative and interesting presentations and also to all of you who've joined us this morning. As Veli Packer noted at the start, this was the second of SEER's webinar series on data. The first considered the topic from a customer point of view, while today is focused on system data. And um, certainly from my point of view, it was really good to hear presenters from all parts of the energy industry talk about how important data is in allowing them to more effectively do their jobs. We heard about the important frameworks in place to start to remove barriers to data exchange and allow better sharing of data. And I think we've also heard um, how different parties do actually want more data and that there are very different perceptions about what, the, what other parties do now and need in future with, with respect to data. Um, so I feel while we must celebrate the improvements that have been made so far, um, we certainly do need to recognize that there is still more to do. Um, and uh, we, we just need to keep on um, with these conversations um, because I think it's, it's, it's really helpful for people to understand the different perspectives and, and the different issues. And certainly the discussions we've had today will be very helpful for NRAs as we think about what areas we need to prioritize. And I hope it's been similarly very informative to you all as participants. Just a final point, uh, the workshop has been recorded and it will appear on SEER's YouTube page. So if you have any further comments or questions, um, please do get in touch with SEER. So from all of us, thank you very much for participating. Goodbye and have a good day.